Kev, you know Augustus Gloob? You mean one of the fictional children on the Wonka tour in Roald Dahl's much-loved classic Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Yep. Well, vaguely. Was he the one that was caught drinking metal chocolate straight from the river on the boat ride? That's him. Fell overboard, got sucked down river, pulled in a big pipe that ultimately made him very, very thin? Not in my version. Oh, God. I think he got off too lightly. That's worrying. I think they all did, to be honest, but especially Gloop. So I've rewritten the whole book from the ground up. Changed it from a nostalgic children's tale with mild cautionary undertones to a harrowing tragedy of grief and horror, told from the perspective of the Oompa Loompas, who, in my version, aren't just factory workers with a sideline and being low-level henchmen, but now take centre stage as full executioners of rules and authority. I see. And presumably everyone else on the tour has reason to be scared of them too? Oh yeah, but especially Augustus Gloop. They really make an example of him, Kev. In fact, I've even changed the title of the story to... F.U. Gloop, an Oompa Loompa manifesto for justice. Sounds like a copyright nightmare. Oh, they won't be the only ones having nightmares, Kev. You see, in my version, when Gloop falls in the chocolate river, the Oompa Loompas fish him back out again and carry him away in their tiny hands, screaming and terrified to a door simply marked, no one who ever goes through this door ever comes back through it again, ever. Of course, by now, all the other children are crying and the parents are wishing that mobile phones have been invented or that they'd at least check the small... This isn't an advert for Twerzel's chocolate. This is a contextually appropriate voiceover inserted to mask whatever nonsensical rant Matt is on right now. Honestly, I listened to the whole thing and now I can't sleep. But try not to think about that. Instead, think about Twerzel's chocolate. There are nobodies under our factory. We're fairly sure of that. And of course, by that point, whatever bone fragments are left, the Oompa Loompas simply grind up in a pepper mill and use to season their dinner. So what do you think? I think we should just focus on the podcast from now on. Oh, great. Is it on? You really haven't got the hang of what a podcast is, have you, Matt? To be honest with you, Kev, I always thought a podcast was something you put in the washing machine to give your clothes an extra freshness. If that's what makes sense to you, we'll do it your way. Just go over to the washing machine and press play. Can do. Um, Welcome to Cat Noir Season 2 Written and performed by Matt Sanders and Kevin Childers This week's episode was built by giants I hate it when things go missing The local butcher David Chop told me the other day he had a pig who'd lost his watch I pointed out to David that none of his pigs were wearing watches He immediately called the police It now seemed 35 watches have been stolen, and I really know nothing about how pigs measure time. I'm always watching. It's 9.09pm. Okay, Brian, good to meet you. Uh, We're on page 53. Um, You're providing the voice of the dragon, and we'll be narrating the rest of the book from here. Okay, Ian. I I can't hear you too well, Brian. I'll just adjust the volume a bit. Is that okay? Uh, No, that's not much better. Could you try a little closer to the mic, please? How's that? Okay, not impossible. Look, we'll go for a chapter and I'll normalise the recording afterwards. Bring it up in volume. Don't worry, it'll work out great in the edit. I hope. Excellent, Ian. I'll start at the top. Sorry? I'll start at the top. No, I didn't get it. I'll start at the top. Okay, start at the top. Recording. I swooped in on the thermal, circling the castle, leaving large wing-shaped Too shadows. Too loud, Brian. Sorry, Ian. Okay. I'll bring the volume down a little. I swooped in on the thermal. Now I can't hear you. Sorry, Ian. I'll I'll try and go somewhere in between. I'm sure you will. Okay, we are recording. I swooped in on the thermal. Circling the castle. Leering large wing-shaped shows across the valley. Why, why, why? Oh, Stella. Why did I stop working with you? Will the owner of a bright orange Dodge Charger with 01 painted on the doors and a horn that goes please come to the front desk? Your vehicle has not aged well and is no longer culturally appropriate, so we're having it towed. Thank you. The president's dead. We need to get the first lady to safety. Keep your head down. This way, my lady. Okay. Shooter was up high. Keep behind the cars and let's get to that building. Roger that. Okay. I think we're safe. Are you hurt, Mrs. Kennedy? No. 
People of Dallas, I, Duke Rendor, have returned from the future to warn you. President Kennedy will be assassinated in three days. <laughs> too soon. Too soon. <laughs> well, sorry, everyone. I'll try again. Wait. What the hell just happened? Call it in. Package safe. Uh, where are we? Book depository. People of Dallas, I, Duke Rendor, have returned from the future to... Oh, really? It's this time travel device. It's cheap crap. Sir, put your hands on top of your head. I haven't done anything wrong. Final warning. Okay, okay. Look, I'm late, but it's not a wasted journey. At least I can tell you who killed JFK. No! No, tell me! Tell me! East Mid-Southwest Radio! We've all got the hits and it's rain rain go away come again well every day i guess for these guys here on east mid southwest radio as we head over to stargazing live oh it's a bit cold tonight bundy it's a night to chill the soul ted but it certainly chilled the air did you see the icicles hanging above the observatory door as you came in tonight like fractured tears from a broken dream, Ted. Hmm, I suppose so. And it's meant to be a full moon tonight, although you wouldn't know it with those rain clouds. The horror. Even through the telescope, I can't see a single thing. <laughs> I can't even tell if the lens cover's on or off. How grisly, Ted. Ghoulish. You're using an interesting phrasing of words tonight, Bundy. More macabre than usual. It's Halloween, Ted. Oh my goodness, it is Halloween. I'd completely forgotten. And it's a full moon tonight, too. And Friday the 13th, Ted. Yeah, that's right. It isn't that often that both Halloween and Friday the 13th fall on the same day of the year, is it? Unprecedented, Ted. Hmm, I thought so. And yet, here we are, two weary stragglers aboard this knotted hulk of wood and steel, desperate to find safe passage through such an accursed night. Not even the North Star to guide us safely to shore, Ted. I can only hope that nothing truly terrifying happens to either of us. What are you up to, Bundy? Uh, what? Oh, oh uh, nothing, Ted. I, I was just, I, I was just, I was just saying. I hope that nothing truly terrifying happens to either of us. Good grief, Bundy! Whatever was that? <clears throat> what was what? That horrible, horrifying, blood-curdling monster scream. I think it was a werewolf, Ted. What? That doesn't make me feel any better at all. Well, it is Halloween and Friday the 13th. Yes, but they're just dates on the calendar, Bundy. There's no reason for a werewolf to actually be traipsing around outside our observatory. Good grief, it's a full moon too. I suggest we remain calm and rational and that we sit here quietly, hoping that whatever it was, was a mere one-off coincidence and that it doesn't happen again. Yes, yes, you're quite right, Bundy. We are men of science and reason. Here to map the night's majestic sky, not to get carried away by a frightful handful of coincidences on a truly diabolical night. Indeed, Ted. I'm sure that whatever it was has long gone now, and that we won't be hearing that particular sound ever again. Rum and coconuts, Bundy, there it is again! I truly fear that whatever made that first noise is not going away at all. Oh, Ted, you really are too much. You see... Locks and lordy, Ted, whatever was that? guessing that whatever called out the first time this second thing is now responding to but 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 that simply can't be ted whatever not be- because it was me ted i was the thing that called out the first two times slow down bundy you're not making any sense it does sound quite irate but i don't understand ted don't you see it was me i i engineered the whole thing what bundy Oh, Ted, I'm all a quiver. I'm, I'm so dreadfully sorry. I, I don't know what to think. Tell me like you're explaining the atomic structure of a dandelion, Bundy. Well, well, it was all a joke. Just a harmless practical joke. You see, I wanted to play a prank on you because it's both Halloween and Friday the 13th. And so I was reading through my book, 101 Ways to Scare Your Friends with a Single Werewolf Sound Effect by J.P. McCulloch, and I decided to implement method number 46, which is to play a werewolf sound effect in your presence in order to give you a scare. Really, Bundy? I'm shocked. I rigged up the werewolf so I could trigger it at any time during the broadcast at the touch of this very button here, Ted. Like this. Bundy, 
you are full of surprises. But this time I fear I've endangered us both, Ted. Is it possible my shenanigans have gone too far? Could my harmless tomfoolery really have summoned forth this wretched beast now lurking around in the gloom outside the observatory, waiting for us to finish our humble stargazing before it brutally tears the door off its hinges and comes to gobble us up with its jagged, blood-stained teeth? Ted, we're all doomed! Oh, Bundy, you really are too much. There's nothing to fear, my friend. There is no monster. What? Well, I knew all along it was both Halloween and Friday the 13th today. And when I came here earlier, I saw you reading the truly excellent book 101 Ways to Scare Your Friends with a Single Werewolf Sound Effect by J.P. McCulloch, and I guessed you might be up to something. Really, Ted? Yes. So I had a quick dive down the library and picked up 101 Ways to Respond When a Friend Scares You with a Single Werewolf Sound Effect by J.P. McCulloch. And I went for method number 73, playing a second sound effect to make you think you'd summoned a terrible monster with your own werewolf noise. Ted, I am relieved to hear that. You really mean it that there are no monsters waiting outside? No more than on any other day of the year, Bundy. Goodness me, I do feel silly, Ted. I don't think I'm cut out for larks. What say we leave the practical jokery to the professionals from here onward? I think that's a splendid idea, Bundy. I don't suppose you have more sound effects lined up, do you, Ted? Um, no. You? No, just the werewolf call. What say we have a quick cuppa and then wrap the show up early tonight, Ted? That's a splendid idea, Bundy. I'll get the kettle on. Will the owner of a very heavily armoured and weaponised helicopter please come to the front desk? I don't even know where to start with this one, thank you. Are you bored of winter? Those long days without any light? The incessant cold and unrelenting rain? Then just turn your calendar back to July. Crank up the heating and put a paddling pool in your lounge. Seriously, instant summer. No one need know. Trust me. Excuse me. Bear with me. Uh, I just want to pay the bill. I'll get you when I can, but there's a lot going on in here today. I'm rushed off my feet. No, you're not. You're leaning against the wall with your hands in your pockets. I'm surveying the land. For what? Wildebeest? Ambience. Satisfaction. Expressions of tables of meals brought and plates taken. Digestion periods. Anticipation. The entire customer experience. What about people wanting to pay their bill? Oh, certainly. I recognize that's an important aspect of the whole dining ballet. But you need to give these things time, sir, in order to save our life's richer moments. The hell is that supposed to mean? You've only just finished eating, sir. Lindsay took your dessert plate away, let's see, one minute, thirty-seven seconds ago. And here you are, fumbling around with your napkin, keen to stand up. You'll only get indigestion. I mean, you barely had time to get your breath back from the thirty-two ounce rare medium steak with peppercorn sauce and cheesy fries with the side order of garlic bread and the second side order of onion rings. I mean, you waited six minutes and thirty-five seconds for your creme brulee to arrive, but you're not able to give it five minutes before hurrying on to the next busy aspect of your life. Sounds like you're asking for stomach trouble. Listen, you've bamboozled me with a frighteningly in-depth knowledge of customer behaviour. Now I just want to pay for my bill and leave, thanks. Were you aware you opened three sachets of ketchup for your cheesy fries, but that you were in such a hurry to start the steak, you squirted out less than a complete sachet's worth from all three? Now, look, this is getting a bit much. But what put you in such a hurry, sir? What carries you striding through the day with nary a second to let your very carb-heavy lunch settle? Or even the time to ensure the complete use of a single ketchup sachet, negating what ultimately became the wastage of a third or two. Okay, I'm done. I either pay my bill now or I'm going to leave without paying. Your choice. Very well, just pop your card in this machine, sir. Okay, it's contactless. Much like its owner. Do you often dine alone? I am warning you. Okay, thank you. I trust that concludes our business here today. Apparently for you it does. You've had your meal, paid your bill, and off you go, striding onto whatever aspect of your daily life is urgent enough for you to waste ketchup sachets and ignore basic healthy living by being unable to remain seated for more than two minutes after you've eaten, but indulgent enough to allow you the time to enjoy a fine creme brulee, sir. I've paid my bill. What more could you possibly want from me? Just one more thing. I watched the way you tucked into the garlic bread and onion rings. Have you ever read up on gout? Now look. I'm getting a little annoyed. Increased sodium from the high salt content, I expect. Do you know how much salt was in your food before you started shaking on more at the table? Pack it in. Nine shakes, sir. Nine shakes of salt on an already very fatty, salty meal. I, I'm going. Are you sure, sir? I mean, really sure? Is there nothing else you wanted to mention before we conclude our business here today? What are you getting at? Well, it's just that when you sat at this table at 128 and 46 seconds this afternoon, sir, the condiments at your table side included nine ketchup. 
eight mayonnaise, nine malt vinegar, and seven sachets of English mustard. So what? Just one more thing. When I give a cursory glance over to your table side now, sir, I can only see six packets of ketchup, which would be correct given your liberal usage of the three aforementioned sachets, sir. Eight mayonnaise, as was the case on your arrival, but somehow only six sachets of mock vinegar and a very surprising mere two packets of English mustard. What are you saying? Well, I'm saying that unless I'm very much mistaken, which I may be, somewhere in the course of your 32-ounce medium rare steak with peppercorn sauce and cheesy fries with the side order of garlic bread, a second side order of onion rings and a rather pitiful splat of ketchup from what could have been for others an abundant sauce, and not forgetting, of course, the tasty creme brulee that followed, sir, somehow... In amongst this culinary adventure, your table has lost three sachets of malt vinegar and a further five sachets of English mustard. Now, I don't know about you, but I struggle to find satisfactory reasoning for a happening such as that, sir. Unless the restaurant's haunted, of course. I mean, do you suppose that's what it is, sir? Ghosts? Okay, fine. Look, take your damn sachets. This place is too weird for me anyway. I am never coming back here again. Okay. Just one more thing. Next Wednesday afternoon, just before you play squash with Wally, you'll be here between 1.13 and 1.44, and you will order of a scamp. Get out of my head! Just one more thing. Can I offer you a mint before you go, sir? Why not take a hand? Okay, fine. Look, I'll see you next week. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. Sophie, I got your sachets back. Foghorn's Lance, we got a hell of a show coming up here tonight. Oh yeah, I'm super stoked to be here, Vince. You can literally smell the excitement. You got yourself a tan, Lance? I ain't seen you all week. Where you been? <laughs> you noticed that, hey, Vince? I've been spending a little time over in sunny California. And what have you been doing out there, Lance? Well, I've been listening to some Foghorn. Oh, yeah. That's what we're talking about right here. Foghorns. So where do you get to, Lance? I started out in San Korea. Uh-huh. And from there, I headed down to San Antonio Bay, and you know what I heard whilst I was there, Vince? What did you hear, Lance? Foghorns. Ah, oh, yeah. That's what we're talking about right here. Foghorns. So did you stay in San Antonio Bay, Lance? No, I headed over to Bogica Bay. And you know what they got there, Vince? Tell me. Foghorns! Ah, yeah! That's what we're talking about right here! Foghorns! Well, I've been right over the other side of the country, Lance, out on Amity Island. And you know what they got out there? What they got on Amity, Vince? Lance, I'll tell you what they got. They got bicycles, Lance. Oh, yeah. Bicycles. Okay, Vince. And they got foghorns, Lance! Foghorns! Ah, yeah! That's what we're talking about right here! Foghorns! Well, I heard a whole plethora of foghorns to keep you stoked for next week's episode, Vince. What have we got coming up then? You know what, Lance? I'm fairly sure we might hear one or two. Foghorns! Ah, yeah! That's what we're talking about right here! Foghorns! We'll catch you next week, folks! Good night! Good night! Matt, have you seen my pen? Of course not, Kev. It's the 21st century. No one writes anything down anymore. We just tap screens. That's all really, really good, but I actually need my pen. I'm afraid I can't help. All I've got are these two brown felt tips that are somehow stuck together. You mean this? Yep. Matt, that's a Kit Kat. Is it? No wonder that drawing I did smells funny. Well, I've got to make some notes for the podcast, so I have to find my pen. I'm sure I had it here earlier. What we really need is logic and reasoning. Oh, I've got a cupboard full of that. Have you? How come? Well, you remember the nine marples in the last episode? What, the ones that nearly gave Gary the trainee sound engineer a breakdown when it came to editing? Yep, they're the ones. They've taken up residence in the cupboard under the stairs, Harry Potter style. Have they? Yeah, take a look. <laughs> oh, hello, dear. Oh, oh, yes, dear. Yes, Perhaps for what another one of your little plays. Dear. Marples, can you help me find my pen? I need it to make notes for the podcast. Of of course, dear. Yeah. This yeah. Cupboard. Think about yeah. exactly yeah. where you Certainly were, the right yeah. what yeah. you were doing when you were last and using where were you it. seated? Um, I was in my usual place, over by the coffee table, sitting on the sofa. Well, if it's no longer on the coffee table, and dear... And since a pen is cylindrical, yeah. dear... And given the often flat surface of a coffee table, dear... One might suppose that it must have rolled. And if no one has stolen it, dear... Then the pen must logically be off the table. I would check on the floor, dear. It might certainly be wise to look under the coffee table if it's no longer upon it. How are you getting on? They say to look under the coffee table. 
Do they? Hang on then. Oh yeah, here it is. Kev, I've got it. Fantastic. Ah, oh, thank you, ladies. Matt's found the pen right where you said it would be. Not at all, dear. You're welcome, please, dear. Oh, please, how beautifully dear. put. My sentiments in It's comforting dear. that logic once again One's prevails. One's future is always present when one can see the path, dear. I know exactly what you mean, dear. Here you go, Kev. Here's your pen back. Safe and sound. Thanks, mate. Thanks for your help, ladies. Wait a minute. Kev? Yeah? There's only eight of them. What? It's supposed to be nine. I remember Gary saying that he edited nine. Oh my God, you're right. One of our marbles is missing. Whatever are we going to do? We need to get her back, Kev. I'm not done marbling yet. I've got a plan. Quick, to the Cat Noir mobile. So we've just got the one line right after the end of the music. The pre-recorded part of the advert says hot chocolate. Then you say your line. Wait for the words hot chocolate, then go for it. Okay? Recording. Hot chocolate. Hang on. What are the options? You've been listening to Cat Noir. This episode was written, performed, recorded and produced by Kevin Chilvers and Matt Sanders with editing by Gary the Trainee Sound Engineer and the guest announcer was me. If you have been affected by any of the issues raised in this episode then please seek immediate medical attention or follow us on Instagram at Cat Noir Podcast. The Cat Noir Podcast is sponsored by zapsflat.com It's where we get nearly all of our sound effects from. Join us next time for more of this. Hello, Mr. Godwin speaking. Hello, sir, it's Chris. I'm sorry, who? Chris, on behalf of Hooper's Electricals. Never heard of you, but I'm in a hurry anyway, and I'm really not interested in whatever it is you've got to sell, so... Oh, I'm not trying to sell you anything, sir. This is about something you've bought from us already. Oh, I see. My apologies. I'm still in something of a hurry, though. Uh, what was it I bought, and is there some sort of problem with it? No, no problem at all, sir. It was just that you purchased a washing machine from us, and the extended warranty is about to come to an end, so I wondered if you wanted to extend it even further, for only £4 a month. A washing machine? That's right, sir. Only £4 a month. Look, I think there's been some sort of confusion. My wife sorted out our washing machine about a year and a half ago. Oh, well, this one's a little older than that, sir. And this one's definitely only in your name, Mr Goodwin. You purchased this from our branch in Croydon. Uh, Mr Godwin, and, and what? When? Fifteen years ago, sir. Are you serious? Well, it was the extended warranty you had, sir. It's now come to an end. That's what I'm calling you today. This is ridiculous. I'm not interested in extending the warranty of an appliance I bought some 15 years ago. I don't even know where the damn thing is. Washing machines are usually kept in the kitchen, sir. Now listen... I'm surprised at both the longevity of your warranties and your loyal commitment to customers, but I really am in a hurry. You see, I'm going to have to call the police. Unfortunately, I've had my car stolen. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. What happened, if you don't mind me asking? Well, I parked it round the corner in Florence Street, but when I went back for it this morning, it was gone. That is a rotten bit of luck, sir. When did you last see your car? 1987.